All right, morning, everyone. Jared, how's the camera? It's good. Right here. So this way. Okay. All right, good morning. Welcome to Chinese Church in Christ South Valley. It's good to see you all today. Um, and uh, if you're just joining us, we have been going through the book of First Kings, which is maybe not the most common book of the Bible to many of us, but I'm really excited about today's passion and, uh, uh, passage and what it has to say to us. And um, what we're going to, we're not going to read the whole section, but what we're going to see is actually what I think is one of the really kind of few really vivid pictures of imagery in the Bible that actually has great meaning. And so I'll explain more as we get into it. But um, this message is really about the building of the temple. And where we left off last week was Daniel was sharing with us, King Solomon is about to build the temple. And it's this passage, you kind of almost get like a TV or even social media view of what the temple would have looked like, right? Um, in the year 2000, there was a show that came out on MTV called MTV Cribs. Is anyone familiar with this show? Or is most of the audience too young? Sabrina's got it, all right. Someone, someone burst in pop culture, I love it. If you've never heard of MTV Cribs, what it is is it's a TV show where they would like take a look at lives of like rich and famous people's houses, right? So for different celebrities, they would go in and they would like take a like nice, like kind of like tour of like how amazing like these giant rich houses look. There's, there's probably a slide I had for this one that goes up there. I don't know whose house this is, it's like, taken from a website with free photos and it's somewhere in Spain, but it's like, you kind of get this picture of a, of a mansion, right? And it looks really nice. Um, I realize on Instagram, there's an account I follow that's just called Golf Clubhouses, because I like enjoy playing golf. And so it's like, you know, if you just go to a normal small city run course, it's gonna be this old building that's like lacking resources. But like on this Instagram account, there's all of these like nice, beautiful buildings that people like to marvel at, right? And so um, the funny thing about the show, MTV Cribs, is sometimes there was even controversy because sometimes when the camera crews would come, people would actually take them to someone else's house that was like more expensive than theirs and with nicer features just to kind of show it off. And then there would be questions of like how legitimate it was. Um, the reason this idea is really exciting to me is I feel like here at CCIC South Valley, for a long time, we had our version of MTV Cribs, and clearly I'm not talking about our building, because our building is old. If you might see a spider running by your feet like while you're here, we already saw that during prayer meeting. Um, but in 1999, Greg Robertson, one of our elders, he moved into this big, giant house, like cr pretty close by church. Is the photo up there right now yeah. of Greg? Okay, so that photo is like, I pulled it off of Greg's Facebook photos last night, but the photo is like Greg, it's his photo album of all the different, what he called exotic animals that visited his backyard because he lived at the base of the foothills, not too far away. And if you've been to his old house, it was like really, really incredible. So when he moved in, a lot of us in the youth group, we helped him move and we were like, he was giving us a tour and it felt like MTV Cribs. Like he's got a tennis court with a basketball court on it. There's this pool here. And like there was this big giant room inside where he had a pool table, a foosball table. And like, you know, we would go over there for youth group and just hang out and have a great time, right? And then it's like, like it, the more like I went over there, the more you would discover like just how many rooms there were in the house. Like you didn't realize how big this house was. It actually belonged to one of the former San Francisco 49ers players. So it's like when we helped him move in, there was a San Francisco 49ers logo on the driveway and eventually he paved over it. But if you're familiar with the famous like Christian song, Big House by Audio Adrenaline, though like most of you are too young to get this, which is really, really sad to me, but that's okay. But like if you know the song, it talks about a big, big house with lots and lots of rooms, right? Our youngest member knows it. Thank you, Andrew. Like, I saw him not. Okay. That means it's a, it's a very iconic song because it talks about how big the house is. And the premise is that in heaven, this is what it's like to enjoy the house of God, right? And like that house, Greg's house, it made it feel like the audio adrenaline song where it's like, big, big house, like 
it's the Robertson's house. Like that's like really what like I would I would think about when we went there. And it was like all of us who got to tour it, it felt like MTV Cribs, right? Now, um, that was like there's so there was actually so much more to us experiencing like getting to go over to Greg and Jenny's house, and I'll explain more about that as we get into the passage. Um, but this passage of the Bible is the it's like the most photographic view of a like a building, a structure. And up to this point, there haven't been too many passages that go into this level of detail to describe something. There's a few, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But First Kings gives us this picture of the temple of God that Solomon built. And when we come to church to worship, not that like, you know, our building's old, we can't like upgrade it that much because then we would have to address so many other like things that we're out of code in and like, you know, so like our parking lot's not big enough. There's all kinds of problems, right? Hopefully no one from like the city department is like listening to this right now over the internet. But um, like what this shows us is there's something important about the place that we come to worship God. There's something important about it. And it was a big deal for King Solomon to now build this new and big and beautiful temple for the people of God. And so um, kind of the context to help us catch up to where we've been at in 1 Kings that will show us uh, the importance of the temple of God, the place to worship him. Um, what we've seen so far in the book of 1 Kings, we've seen a transition in Israel's kingship from King David to his son, King Solomon. It did not come without like lots of problems because of uh, just the, the multiple wives and multiple sons that David had that all were trying to seek their claim to the throne. Um, but finally, King Solomon is crowned as king. And we've seen how Solomon received godly wisdom. Um, he had this dream with God where God said, like, almost as if it was like a genie in a magic lamp, right? And, and Solomon asks God for his wisdom. And what we saw last week, Daniel took us through the passage where Solomon is beginning to establish his kingdom. He's putting the right people into place to like be in positions of leadership so they could start building the temple. And so then, today, we're going to see what happens when the temple is actually built, and when it's completed, and what that means for us. And we might think this big, giant building that David was building, like, in, you know, the middle of, like, the kingdom of Israel, like, thousands of years ago, we might think that's a nice picture of history, but I really think it has great meaning for our lives today. And hopefully we can see that as we go through it. So we're going to see three things in this passage as we talk about the temple of God. We're going to see that the temple is a promise. The fact that Solomon got to build this temple, it shows how faithful God is to his people Israel. We'll see that. Um, we'll talk about that. Secondly, we're going to see that the temple beauty, because it, it really kind of like reminds us of like what we might see if we ever watched MTV Cribs with all these like big, beautiful pictures of this one dwelling place. We're going to see that this beauty reflects God. If the temple was made to be big and beautiful, it's going to show how that beauty is meant to show who the true object of worship is. And then finally, we're going to see, and this is where Daniel landed in chapters 4 and 5 and a little bit into chapter 6 last week, that the temple is God's dwelling place. And we're going to further that idea next week as well. But those are the three things that we're going to see in today's passage. So first, we're going to see how the temple is a promise. And that's really important. For further kind of context for us, We've referenced the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel before because it tells us about David's life. And so the first way we're going to see how the completion of the temple that we see in 1st Kings chapter 6 and 7, it starts with the promise that God makes in 2nd Samuel chapter 7. And so at this time, King David, he was busy fighting off Israel's enemies. There were lots of wars going on. David really was known as, I mean, the Bible describes him as a man after God's own heart, which is kind of speaks to his character and his heart for God. But when it comes to David's function as a king, his main function was to defeat the enemies of the nation of Israel. He was constantly fighting in wars, constantly fighting off Israel's enemies. And if you know anything about the history of God's people, they had been subject to other nations because they didn't have a strong sense of wanting to worship God or a strong sense of leadership. And David's role as king was to fight off all the other threats and bring Israel to a place of safety. Now in that, David wanted to build a temple for God because he realized they had been carrying around the Ark of the Covenant and the Ark had the two tablets 
More on the Ark next week. But the Ark had the two tablets, the stone tablets, that had the Ten Commandments that were given to Moses to be a part of God's people. The Ark had gone missing. It had been captured throughout Israel's history in all of their unfaithfulness to worship God. But the fact that they had the Ark, it was like it represented the presence of God kind of with them. And so David said, now that he had established some peace, he's saying, we need to have a permanent place for the Ark. And it's really interesting, this conversation that he has with God, and the prophet Nathan is involved in it. But I'm just going to read two verses that speak to this promise that God gives David. And so David says to God, like, I want to build this new house so the the Ark of the Covenant, it will have a more permanent resting place than just being carried around from place to place in this kind of portable tent, which was the place of worship and sacrifice, right? Um, But this is what 2 Samuel chapter 7 says. And God says to David, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And so David's been working hard to establish the nation of Israel. He's been fighting off all the enemies. And part of the purpose for why David wasn't able to build a temple himself was because he was so preoccupied with the military part of establishing Israel, it's almost like Israel was not at peace enough to actually focus, like, dedicated time to build the temple, especially the kind of temple that David knew would be honoring to God. And when you see the beauty and the detail of the temple, which we'll get into, you can see how there's no way he'd be able to do that at the same time while he's constantly fighting off Israel's enemies. But it's also really interesting to see how, um, though it was not in God's plan for David to build a house, how he receives this promise where God says your son is going to be the one who builds the temple. Um, There's really two, like, really kind of interesting reasons that go into this. One, of course, as I've been saying, it shows that there needed to be a greater time of peace for the establishment of the temple to, like, kind of be the next step for the nation of Israel to be like established as a nation. There needed to be more peace so they wouldn't be worried about building like the temple at the same time while enemies might be attacking, right? But the other really cool thing about this promise that God gives David is David, out of like a great place of motivation, says, God, I want to build you a house. I want to build a house to the Ark of the Covenant, the place where we worship, the place where we sacrifice, has a permanent place. The really cool thing about this covenant is it's a way where God is saying, I know you want to build a house, and that comes from great motivation. But the way my promise is going to work is let me show you how I will build a house for you. Which is kind of a, like, something David probably didn't think about as he's, like, having this desire. And we're going to see at the end of 1 Kings 7 how this becomes, like, a big deal. That the house of God, the temple of God, is finally built. And to see the role that King David played in it, even... Even though it wasn't him building it, it was his son. So this is the promise that you see God giving David. And in the passages that we left off on, last, that we finished with last Sunday, we kind of saw the whole purpose for the temple in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 11, right? And these were the last three verses we read last Sunday, but I want to read them again. And so Solomon has begun building the temple. It's describing the, um, the exterior, the outside of the temple being built. But there's these three verses that are really powerful that kind of talk about the purpose of the temple that we read last week. And it says this starting in verse 11 of 1 Kings chapter 6. Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon. Concerning this house that you are building, if you will walk in my statutes and obey my rules and keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will establish my word with you, which I spoke to David your father, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. And it shows that the whole, we're going to get into this more, the whole purpose for why the temple was being built was that there would be an established place where God's people could go and worship. And it could be a reminder that God was with them, that the people of God could experience his presence. And so when we say that the temple is a promise, it comes from this promise that God made to David back in 2 Samuel chapter 7. But verse 14, though it's very short, and though it's meant to be a like a, narr- a piece of narration, a story marker. This is actually a really profound verse when you consider all the history. And verse 14 says, So Solomon built the house and finished it. There had never been a temple built 
for the purpose of worshiping God up to this point in Israel's history. And if you think about the history of God's people, everything that they had been through, beginning with Abraham, right? Leaving his people, getting this promise from God. Um, I'll say more about that in just a moment. But um, you see how God's people had been wandering, had gone through different things. They had been enslaved by the nation of Egypt. God had delivered them from Egypt when they crossed through the Red Sea. But then inevitably, they would fall back into worshiping other gods and forgetting about God. And while uh, after escaping from Egypt, they developed the tabernacle, which was the tent that like was home to the Ark of the Covenant and the tablets with the Ten Commandments. It was really a temporary place to be able to conduct like worship and sacrifice in the way that God had laid out for his people. But there had never been anything so established as the temple. Years and years and years of Israel fearing, am I going to live another day? because the, the nations around us are more powerful, finally, finally, at long last, God gave them a king, King David, who could fight off all of the threats and bring them to a time of peace and bring them to a time of being established where they could finally build the temple of God. It's one verse, it's part of the story, but this is thousands of years of Israel's history of wandering and like trying to worship God but failing and then finally, they're at a place where they are at peace and God helps them establish a permanent place of worship that would be very meaningful. Now, unfortunately, spoiler alert for future First Kings sermons, it doesn't, this, this period of like actual prosperity doesn't last very long because the people of Israel will slip back into worshiping other gods very soon. And unfortunately, that's the case. But this passage is meant to show us that God is faithful to his promise. He promised in a previous generation to King David, you will be able to build a house, but you're not going to be the one who builds it. It's going to be your son. But now that Solomon has completed it, it shows all the years that God has been present with his people. And that's the last verse we left off with. The whole purpose of building the temple was it was a place where God's people would be able to remember the presence of God with them. And though it doesn't last for long in the big picture of 1 Kings, this is such an important moment for the people of Israel. It's one more way where it shows God is faithful to his promises. And if you think about the promises that God has made to his people before, leading up to this point in the Bible, you saw Abraham, who was given the promise that though he was close to 100 years old and there was no human way that him and his wife would actually have offspring, God says, look up at the stars and count them. That's how many offspring you're going to have. And God actually makes it happen. Even though Abraham is like, there's no way this could possibly come true. And his wife is even more like, they come up with their own way to try to have kids like outside of their, their marriage. And that like, you know, that's their human plan. It doesn't go well, but it shows that God is eventually faithful to his promise. And then when God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, it's a way that it has a permanent kind of governance over his people of how to live long beyond just when Moses was alive and leading God's people. So you see promises that God has made and his faithfulness throughout the entire history of God's people. When they were oppressed, he led them through the Red Sea, which, you know, we know that story, but if you think about what it actually must have been like, I mean, I can't imagine a more, like, it's like the understatement of the century to say it must have been a really, really powerful experience. But it shows how God has been faithful from, this, from start to finish with his people. And now the building of the temple is one more way to show us God remembers his promises. God is faithful to answer. And we see that here now that the temple is built. And so hopefully this shows us how faithful our God is. And maybe this is a little bit of a commentary uh, for us if we have trouble believing this of like our impatience as humans, particularly humans living in 2021 who now have the internet because the internet makes everything instant for us. If you don't know the answer to something, you just Google it. We're so used to that instant gratification. But when you look at the big picture of God's people, look at how faithful God is. And I think many of us really do want to believe in the promises of God, but sometimes it takes time. And the building of the temple is a sign that says that God will do what he says he's going to do. That's not the only example you see in the Bible. But I don't want us to look past that as we start to think about what the temple actually looked like. The fact that it was built 
was no small thing. It shows how faithful God was to his promises. God's people have had all kinds of ups and downs, but God never fails to be faithful. And we have a lot of ups and downs in our lives as well. But hopefully we can see in the big picture how faithful our God is in answering his promises. And so when the temple is finally built, not only is it this promise that must have been a big deal to Israel, but when you actually start to take a look at the description of the temple, it is incredibly beautiful. And that brings us to our second point for this morning, where the temple beauty reflects who God is. Now, there is no possible way for me to read this entire section. Like, you guys know me, when I preach the Old Testament, I like to read, like, every verse. Like, I tend to get the shorter chapters, and Daniel gets the longer ones, so I can actually, like, read the whole thing. There's no possible way to do that today. But I wanted to read one description, one part of the description of the temple. And really, this will give us a picture of what most of the second half of chapter 6 and the entirety of chapter 7 look like when it's describing the temple that Solomon built. In addition to his own palace, but that's a small section. Um, I'll put up a kind of a description of the different features in a moment. But let's read chapter 6, verses 15 to 22, just to get a sense of the beauty of the temple that, was, that had been built. So starting in verse 15, it says this. He lined the walls, he being Solomon, you know, overseeing the construction. Obviously, he had lots of help. But that's the context. He lined the walls of the house on the inside with boards of cedar. From the floor of the house to the walls of the ceiling, he covered them on the inside with wood, and he covered the floor of the house with boards of cypress. He built 20 cubits of the rear of the house with boards of cedar from the floor to the walls, and he built this within as an inner sanctuary, as the most holy place. The house, that is, the nave in front of the inner sanctuary was 40 cubits long, and the cedar within the house was carved in the form of gourds and open flowers. All was cedar, no stone was seen. The inner sanctuary he prepared in the innermost part of the house to set there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high, and he overlaid it with pure gold. He also overlaid an altar of cedar. And Solomon overlaid the inside of the house with pure gold, and he drew chains of gold across in front of the inner sanctuary and overlaid it with gold. And he overlaid the whole house with gold until all the house was finished, and also the whole altar that belonged to the inner sanctuary he overlaid with gold. I'm going to stop there, but that's kind of, it gives you a picture of what the temple description was like when it's been built and when it's been finished. And so, um, just a quick summary. Uh, so, if you want to go back and read the entire description, I would encourage you to do this because it's beautiful. Um, but here's a uh, kind of a list of the different um, things. Uh, I should have it on the slide here. Uh, but chapter 6 and 7, it's really a description of five different things. There's the exterior of the temple in chapter 6, verses 2 to 10. Is it up there on the screen? You guys can see it? Cool. Okay. Um, there's the interior there's the furnishings and features within the temple. And then there's about 10 or 11 short verses where it talks about Solomon building his own house, which was close by the temple. And then finally, the end of chapter 7, for many verses, talk about the artifacts within the temple. And they all kind of follow this pattern that we just read. And so when we're reading this, it really, like, if you're familiar with the show, which I guess is only Sabrina, unfortunately, it's like, you really, get, you really get vibes of like what MTV Cribs would be like in a modern day where you're like walking in and seeing this amazing house that someone lives in, right? Like sounds pretty extra, like all the mentions of gold, it's like, you know, you think about like the amounts of like gold and jewelry we have or the amounts of money we spend on designer like accessories, it's like, you know, it's all meant to kind of be a sign of status, right? But you see the same kind of like really kind of wealth uh, that and uh, beauty that describes the temple here. Um, like, it talks about the floors of cedar. A cubit is like a foot and a half. So when it says it's like 20 cubits long, it's like, that's pretty long. It's like 30 feet of like hardwood floors. Like, if you're about to buy a house, which is probably maybe almost none of you that are sitting here listening, because you either have bought a house already or you're many, many years away from it, which is fine. It's like, you'll learn that like hardwood floors are desirable over like carpet in a lot of ways. I actually like carpet because I think it's, I don't know, it's more comfortable walking around. But like, it's more of a sign of like, man, I'm a big baller if I have like hardwood floors, right? 
And so you see this in the description of the temple. And it includes the, um, the inner sanctuary for the Ark of the Covenant. Hopefully we caught that as well. Now, this is really modeled after Exodus chapters 25 to 27, when the tabernacle, the original tent, to house the Ark of the Covenant was being built. And if you think about it, in the Old Testament, this is really kind of the third of three like really extensive descriptions of something that was created. You have the creation story, where it's like, of the days of creation, it's pretty specific, pretty specific language. It goes to great lengths. Then you have the tabernacle in Exodus, and now you have the building of the temple. It's not often that scripture goes to great lengths to kind of describe like what something looks like. I mean, there's a lot of narration, there's a lot of the history, but like this is like two chapters describing the beauty of the temple of God, right? Like you heard about the inlaid with gold. Um, where's Daniel's guitar? Do you have like a, do you have the abalone inlay in there or? No, oh man. Peasant! Okay, no. Um, like Greg, Greg's guitar had like the abalone inlay. I don't even know what it does functionally. Maybe it's just like a sign of like status within a guitar. But it's like, when I see all of the like passages that says overlaid with gold, like you get a sense of just how much gold there was like in the like temple that, that Solomon was building here. Now, I think what this shows us is the beauty it was of the temple and like how descriptive this passage is. It's meant to reflect the beauty of God. And if like you could say it has a lot of similarities to the creation story, obviously the story of creation is meant to show us how carefully God created the world. And you see the same thing here in the building of the temple. Solomon went out of his way to have this plan be built so that the temple would be beautiful. And I don't think it was for the purpose to kind of be, say, like, just to show off and say, look how much wealth we have compared to all of the other nations. Like, you get the sense when you read this within the context that this is really a positive description of what the temple looked like. And when people would walk in, they would say, wow, it is a beautiful thing that we have this nice place where we can worship God. But it also reflected all the years of God's faithfulness that we've already talked about, right? And so that shows us that God is meant, God is not only just a God of, a God of order, a God who creates things, but he's also a God of beauty. And you see this on display with the temple. Um, we don't have time to read every single passage, like I said, but there's um, certain well, of the artifacts and the furnishings within the temple. You see uh, a lot of mentions of cherubim, which is like, you know, kind of like artifacts or like sculptures of angels to kind of represent this is the connection that God has with the like divine, that he's ultimate over all of it, that there are all these nice, beautiful statues of angels. It shows that they are a part of this place of worship, but ultimately if the temple is a place to worship him, that he's over all of it, that he's in control of all of it. There's also another part that kind of represents the great sea that talks about kind of the living water, which is a theme throughout the book of the Bible from start to finish. And it shows how God, as the creator of the world and the creator of the earth and the waters, is Lord over all of these things. The purpose of MTV Cribs was to show off your wealth, show off how like amazing your house is, right? And similarly, but in the best way possible, not in like a showy way, the purpose of one of the purposes of the temple is meant to show how amazing and powerful and sovereign our God really is. And so when something is super beautiful, like in creation, like really as people of God, hopefully we don't only marvel at like the creation itself, but we also learn how to marvel at the creator and understand that it came from somewhere, right? Um, and like, I, the older I get, I try to appreciate this when I see something like really amazing that's kind of like, kind of out of the ordinary. When I see like beautiful created things, like I'm trying to let that like lead my mind to think about God as the creator. So for example, I think we can see it a lot even when we're here at church. It's like, you know, when I see Jeremiah create the Christmas program the way he did last year, I mean, it was incredible. And hopefully the point is not just to say, okay, we have this nice, beautiful presentation, even though it was, 
But hopefully it's to say it draws us closer to God because God has given us these creative abilities and kind of this unique relationship as a church. When I see Isaac, who was up here playing the guitar last week, he had to go back to, to where he works in Minnesota. But when I see him write songs, as he's shared with us before in different situations in our church, like I kind of marvel at just the way that God has given this ability to play the guitar and to write these amazing songs and to put all of that together. Um, when I see Daniel explain a theological argument, I'm like, wow, like God's given him this intellect that clearly I don't have and I'm so thankful we get to work together because he can help me understand a lot of the theology that I don't see. Hopefully when we see really beautiful and amazing things, it points us to the actual creator of all the good gifts. And that's what the temple was meant to do for the nation of Israel. After all the years of wandering in the, in the wilderness and just wandering in a lack of stability, finally they had a big and beautiful place to be settled and to worship God and to remember who he was and that he was sovereign and that he was in control. And so we've seen that this means God is faithful to his promise, but the beauty is also meant to reflect the creative kind of like excellence that God has way more than anything else in this world. And finally, we're going to see at the very end of this long, beautiful description that it shows that the temple is God's dwelling place as well. So you've, we've seen the, like, if you go back and read it, you can see a description of the temple, the outside, the inside, the artifacts, the inner sanctuary, Solomon's own home. All these things are meant to show, like, just out of, like, the, like, the sheer beauty, like, how to reflect God. But finally, it shows us the importance of how God's presence is with his people. And we see that in the final verse of chapter 7, which I think is really significant. So in this long, the ending of this long section of all this description of the temple, Solomon does something that's really, really important to kind of finish the temple building process. And we see that in the last verse of chapter 7. And that's in verse 51. And it says, Thus all the work that King Solomon did on the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things that David his father had dedicated the silver, the gold, and the vessels, and stored them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. Now, at first glance, you might say, Dan, you just read a passage of like how much gold was already there. Why is it significant that the treasury of King David was brought in? If you think about the promise that God gave David, that yes, the nation of Israel will have a house of worship built for it, but it's not gonna be by you, it's gonna be by your son. We've seen why that shows that now that the temple is built, it shows that God is faithful to his promise. But Solomon has not forgotten all that went into it from his father helping to establish the nation of Israel. And the fact that he brings in the treasury of King David, which probably suggests things that David had kind of like uh, taken possession of by winning wars and like the, the, the money that would come with it or the artifacts that would come with it, these are just things, and there's clearly all kinds of beautiful things, but it shows how the presence of God was with them, with the nation of Israel, as David was fighting off their enemies, and now the, the treasury of David is being brought in to the house of God. And it shows that the presence of God was with his people then, and clearly it is now, as they're beginning this time of peace and worship where they can come in and have this uh, big, beautiful temple to be able to worship God there. And it's a continuation of this promise that we see that David, though like he was not the one to build the house, his son does not forget about him, and it shows God's presence with his people throughout that entire time, right? And so where we landed last week, that the purpose of the temple was so that God's people would have a place where they could experience the presence of God. Now, if, when we combine that with the vast description of the beauty of the temple, it really helps us land in the same place where it shows us that the purpose of the temple, the purpose of God's house, was it was a place where people could experience the presence of God. That is why understanding the history and the purpose of the temple is so important for us today. In all that we are going through, in all of the challenges of what it's looked like to worship God in 2020 and 2021, all of the challenges we see in our world that wears on our mental health, that makes us worry about the future, all of the challenges we've experienced, praise God that though it's looked different and in different forms throughout the entire pandemic, that we have a place where we can worship God. God's people needed it back then, and clearly we need it now as well. 
And it's a completion of what we said earlier, where even though David, out of his best intentions, wants to build a house of God, the fact that it's done and it's finished, you, God can say, look at the house that I built for you. And that is still such an important thing for us here today, September 2021. Now, the thing about Greg and Jenny's house, the Robertson's house, is that um, there's one last picture there, I think. Um, it may, may be slightly out of order, but um, there's a picture from, it was an idea that we had. If you're looking at this from the youth group, either you're having like good flashbacks to where we had a pool movie night where we put up a movie on the projector. If like you didn't experience it, it's because you were too young and you weren't in youth group yet and you're probably getting a massive amount of FOMO right now. Um, but it's like, like that is just one example of the many ways that we got to meet together at Greg and Ginny's house. But here's the funny thing. It was not just that it was a big and giant house, like with a, like a game room and the tennis court and the pool. If you actually talk to Greg and Ginny about why they bought the house in the first place, they wanted a place where people from church could come and spend time together in fellowship. And it had that purpose for us for many, many years. And so I remember when they finally sold that house and moved to a different one a couple years back, when we had our last youth group meeting there, it was emotional for a lot of people. And the reason was because this was a house that yes, it was big and beautiful, yes, it had all these things, but really what it showed us was years and years and years of a place where we could go to experience the presence of God together. And the funny thing about this house is before Greg and Jenny moved into that, when I was in the youth group, which is a long, long, long time ago, before they moved into this house, they lived even closer to church in a three-bedroom house, and they would have no trouble inviting 30 people from the youth group over to their house, even though when I look back on it, I have no idea how we fit into that house. And like, you know, under pandemic guidelines, like this would be like the exact opposite of social distancing. There's no way anyone would be able to go for it. But we were going over to their small house long before we went into this new like, like semi-mansion that they moved into. And it shows us that the ultimate purpose of being with them was not like because of the beauty of the house, but it was because of the fact that we would experience the love of God from meeting together. And all the years that Greg and Jenny would feed us food and feed us spiritual food as well by trying to teach us the Bible, regardless of where they lived in. Now, that might be a big difference in terms of in terms of the size of the house. But that kind of gives us a picture of the importance of the temple as we understand the temple from start to finish in the Bible today. And so the temple was important because we saw that it was the fulfillment of God's promise to David, that he was faithful and that he was true. And it also showed the cosmic significance of God being creator and God being sovereign and the sacred space where people could experience him. But when we think about what the temple means for us today, the way that the biblical history has, sh has kind of taken a turn gives us a new picture of why it was such a blessing for us to go over to either house that Greg and Ginny had. And you see that in the first song that we sang this morning. I had no idea Daniel was going to pick this song. It's pretty cool. Um, I mean, he did know the passage, so like there's that. But it's like the fact that it says, you tore the veil, it is speaking of the temple curtain that was torn when Jesus died on the cross. And that might seem like, you know, like curtains like can tear, right? Not a curtain the size that existed in the temple in Jerusalem. Not without like, like you would probably have to have a massive amount of like tools to be able to rip through like how thick the curtain was. And yet it showed that something supernatural took place when Jesus died on the cross for the sins of this world. We see that in Luke chapter 23. And it says this as a description, as Jesus is dying on the cross. It says, it was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, when the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. If the temple was a place that was meant to contain the presence of God, the power of Jesus' death on the cross meant that the presence of God not only dwelt 
within the four walls of the temple and the inner sanctuary that was built with a purpose and existed that way with a purpose to remind people of how important the presence of God was. But the death of Jesus Christ and having the temple, being, the temple curtain being torn signified that now the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, is going to go and dwell in the hearts of God's people. And that is the era that we live in now. The purpose of the temple and the presence of God was the, was the exact same, but now how we experience it, it looks different. And what that means is the whole purpose of the temple of God, that it meant God is faithful to his promises, that it means that God is the creator of the world and we can worship him from that. Now we, as the recipients of his love and his grace, when we put our faith in him, we get to experience the presence of God wherever we go, but not only that, we get to share the presence of God with people who will need it most. And so the last passage for this morning that kind of shows us that progression of the presence of God, I want to read these verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And Paul says this, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Now the context of 1 Corinthians 6, because it's actually a very like, important, kind of long, substantial argument that Paul's making, it's talking about wholehearted devotion to God. It's talking about fleeing sexual immorality, as, the Bible, as, as God would describe his purpose for marriage, for sexuality. But the bigger picture is not any different than it was for God's people to experience the presence of God. The challenge that they had throughout the Old Testament was how often their attention would turn to other things, how they would worship other gods, and that's why the temple needed to be set apart. And now, with the incredible blessing of the death of Jesus on the cross and the temple curtain being torn, it is why we don't have to go to church to experience the presence of God. Now, certainly we still do, and I think that's why coming here together is really important. But it's not because the presence of God only exists right there in that moment. But now we get to have the purpose where the Spirit of God dwells in us. And we get to experience that, not just when we come to church to worship Him, but the fact that we get to experience a relationship with God wherever we go. And not only that, it gives us the opportunity then to be the beauty of the temple wherever we go. And in a world where people are constantly looking for hope right now, it's an amazing thing that we can go and be the temple of God where people can see that the presence of God is with us wherever we take that. And that's the progression of what the purpose of the temple looked like. Now that's why it's so important that we would continue to meet together like we do here. I would hope that when you come to this building, when we sing the songs that we sing, when we hear from God's word, when we are able to be, even this morning, just sitting and sharing about our lives in our prayer meeting, we didn't even pray for that long. It was like such a blessing because we know that in all that we're going through in our lives, that we're not alone and that we have our brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage us. That's something that we get to experience here. But we don't have to only experience it here, the blessing of the presence of God dwelling in the temple, but now the temple of God being in us is that we get to experience that wherever we go. And in the moments where we might feel the most anxious about the future, and there are many opportunities, we can know that God is faithful to his promises and that he's with us. I remember um, towards the end of my seminary years, walking through our sanctuary in, uh, it was the year before I graduated. And I had come to meet with our former pastor, Fred Mock, about an internship. Um, and that was right before church hired me as an intern. And um, I came in through these doors, the, way, the doors that most of you came in. I said hi to Uncle Rupert, and um, at the time, Auntie Grace, Sarah's mom, was our secretary. So they were in the office. I said hi to them. I said, where's Fred? And he was in the foyer over there, and they said, just go through the sanctuary. And as I was walking through the sanctuary, even though it was just like the middle of like the path to the destination, I couldn't help but stop. And I stopped, and I just thought of like the amount of years of kind of like great vibes and great experiences from meeting together like with our youth group in that sanctuary. It was dark, there were no lights on, I probably ran into a chair, 
But none of that was like, it's not that it's the most beautiful thing in the world, even though I do think it looks like relatively nice, but there's plenty of churches that have a much better like looking sanctuary than our church. But I had to stop and pause when I was walking through there because it was like, wow, like even in this moment, I know that the presence of God is real and I know that it just shows me that he's been with me, he's been walking with me and that I can trust him going into the future. Um, as I know many of us have been mourning uh, the um, passing of Uncle Michael this week, um, I can't think of a more important reminder that the presence of God is with us. And as we've endured different tragedies in our church over the past several years, um, it's a challenge to remember what presence of God really looks like. But it's also an opportunity to remember that though we are incredibly heartbroken at losing someone who meant so much to us, we can know that he is experiencing the ultimate presence of God right now. And that's why it's so important that we understand the purpose of the temple and the purpose of God's presence so that we can know that the presence of God is something that's real and something that can help us in everything that we're going through as we navigate this really crazy, weird time that we live in. And so I pray that like, as we think about what the temple of God, what the house of God is meant to represent, that this would be a place where we could come together and worship, but recognize that worship doesn't just have to stop when we leave from here. But to know that now, living in the era that we do, the Holy Spirit era, that we are able to experience presence of God, not just when we're in this room, not just when we're on this property, but because of God's faithfulness and his promise to us. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. God, we also thank you that this you have created this place, a house of worship for us. To be able to experience your presence, to be able to see how you love us and how you are faithful to us. God, I know in the short term we can lose sight of just how uh, secure we are within your promises, that you will never leave us, that you will never forsake us. And Lord, in the moments where that is hard to believe, God, I pray that uh, whether it be through the body of Christ, whether it comes from being here in this building physically, or if it comes from hearing your voice um, in the quietness of our hearts or through another brother and sister in Christ, that we would have, God, picture after picture of how beautiful it is that we have a relationship with you and how you will not uh, withhold your presence from us. So God, I pray that we would go looking for it. And I pray that also, God, that for people who are just really struggling and in a place of a real lack of hope, that you would be able to use us as your people to be able to show that there is a peace like no other from experiencing the presence of God. And Lord, that um, God, people who don't know you could come to see that there is a God in this world that isn't just impersonal, but that he's loving and that he's good and that he wants to dwell among us. So God, we just thank you for these truths and I pray that they will be encouraging for our hearts and all that we're experiencing this morning. We love you, we pray this in Jesus' name.